hypothesis. Uh, and could be, and hopefully will be critical in the retrograde direction as well. And uh, those negotiations are going on right now. Frankly, Azerbaijan wants to have a, a big part of that business uh, for both, primarily for strategic reasons, but also for, for economic reasons. Um, strategically, uh, number one, uh, as Vlad was just suggesting, uh, the ties of the South Caucasus to Europe is, sh should be our major interest and is, is the primary motivating feature for Azerbaijan, even if it, or even as it de-emphasizes its possible NATO aspirations. Also though, the transportation to and from Afghanistan is a central element in the government of Azerbaijan's strategy to diversify economic growth. Azerbaijan would like Baku to uh, evolve as a transportation hub, uh, linking China uh, and Central Asia, and Afghanistan, that part of Central Asia, to Europe. Uh, and so uh, maintaining that logistical flow will, will remain important for Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan, while they're negotiating a, 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 in a very uh, uh, effective way, <laughs> especially uh, their, uh, their air cargo company, uh, they don't want to lose this opportunity, both strategically and commercially. <coughs> uh, missile defense, um, Gabala, uh, as it exists, is not useful for missile defense, for modern missile defense. I say that with all due respect to my Azerbaijani uh, colleagues here, I mean, it would require some significant upgrades, but the location is great. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, it could, it could be useful in terms of early warning detection as, as it was designed, but as an element uh, for, uh, to participate in the tracking of, let's say, Iranian missiles, uh, the technology is outdated. Uh, but still, the location and the early warning capacity could be significant, and the Azerbaijani government know, knows that and is trying to negotiate a much better deal uh, with the lease. Uh, I uh, uh, always wondered when I was uh, sitting in Azerbaijan whether or not the bargain Azerbaijan is, 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 is uh, demanding aims really to reach an agreement or is a way to give the Russian side a, a pretext to leave. Uh, and I think uh, in Azerbaijan, how one deals with Russia is uh, even more complex than here. I mean, in Azerbaijan, that, that's a, it's a small country on a really important piece of strategic real estate that has to wake up and go to sleep <laughs> every night with Russia right there, with the Iranian government uh, up to terrible things. Uh, in Azerbaijan to disrupt the politics of the country or even to you know, kill people based there <laughs> and visitors. Uh, and so uh, Azerbaijan has to tread very carefully uh, in, in how it uh, projects its long-term ambitions with regard to having the Russian base there in Gabala. Uh, so I think, uh, or I do know, what I do know for certain is that Azerbaijan's senior leadership would love it if Gabala were somehow able to be incorporated into a collaborative approach to missile defense that brings Russia and, and, and NATO together, uh, maybe even more than, than maybe in the cards. Uh, but ultimately, a lot will depend on, on the money question. Uh, as, as far as guarantees for Georgia are concerned with regard to a possible Iranian, uh, I guess, counterstrike, should, should someone else do something in Iran. Uh, well, actually, what I'm most worried about is in Azerbaijan. I mean, there, that is the place where I think there would be uh, an immediate response, immediate, and I think, well, I mean, you, you saw the press stories recently about the success of Azerbaijan's security services in disrupting a plot that uh, seemed to be operating on its own momentum, but certainly would have been, or is an example of the type of uh, operation that would happen in response to any military strike uh, on Iran. I think you'd have a, a large-scale set of those sorts of terrorist actions, I, but I don't, I don't foresee Iranian troop movements uh, into Azerbaijan in that situation. Uh, I think uh, Iran would be very focused on its, its internal situation, and therefore I think it's even less likely that you'd see uh, Iranian uh, troops threatening Georgia, but, but people in this room, of course, have, have different views. Um, I think at this point, there's a, a huge gap in our foreign policy right now between what's happening in Iran and what's happening in the South Caucasus. So I, would, I don't know if anybody within the administration now is thinking about those sorts of guarantees that you raised, Mr. Ambassador. I would put my money on the answer being no, uh, because I experienced myself uh, how, how broad the gap or how wide the gap was with regard to Azerbaijan's potential impact or the impact on Azerbaijan of something happening in Iran. Uh, Azerbaijan, it, it, and, and let's, let's talk about the, the goofy article that came out a couple of weeks ago, just for a moment. Someone else may have been ready to ask that question, but I, now that I've started, I'd just like to make a couple of comments on that. Azerbaijan's greatest fear 
I think, in, in immediate fear these days is that there will be some military operation in Iran. That is the biggest national security nightmare from day to day for Azerbaijan, precisely because of the however many, 25, 30 million ethnic Azerbaijanis that live in northern Iran. Uh, if even a small percentage, if even 1 25th, so 1 million, or, or, or 1 30th, 30, 1 30th uh, of those ethnic Azerbaijanis were to seek safety in Azerbaijan, that would severely disrupt Azerbaijan's society and its economy, just as happened with the 800,000 or a million who were displaced in the Karabakh War and are still being reintegrated into society, still being resettled. So you, if there's a military operation in Iran in the short term, uh, you could see that same sort of humanitarian crisis in an even, on an even larger scale erupting now in Azerbaijan uh, in a way that can create serious disruption. So Azerbaijan doesn't want to see any military operation in Iran. I find it impossible, just impossible to conceive of that Azerbaijan would have granted uh, access to military airfields for Israel to conduct operations against Iran. It would, that would run totally contrary to uh, Azerbaijan taking care of its biggest fear. And therefore, by extension, finally wrapping up, uh, I think there's, there's not much of a chance that there would be uh, a military conflict coming out of Iran that would, that would threaten Georgia. But if there were, I, I, don't think we've been, I don't think we've been thinking about how to do that. Yeah. Russian, Russian, oh, Russian officials are Russian. Oh, yeah, Russian, Russian. Uh, oh Russia, that's all that's recent, yeah. Uh, and and I, I turn to the administration. I would say, uh, to me, it's, it's uh, inexcusable that almost four years have passed since the, what President Obama called, and, and Vlad Sokar called, the Russian invasion of Georgia. Uh, and still, uh, we have not granted permission to Georgia to acquire the weapons it needs to defend against uh, any such repeat of attack. You've got Russian forces deployed in South Ossetia, 24 miles from Tbilisi, right on the main east-west highway and the railroad that is the link to the, the global economy via the port of Koti. Uh, and we still uh, are hesitant to uh, provide, or allow Georgia, to allow Georgia to, to, to purchase uh, the uh, air defense uh, and the uh, anti-armor weapons that, that it needs. Uh, I hope there's some movement in that direction now. Again, I def defer to representatives of the administration to comment on whether or not there is any movement uh, in that direction now. Uh, but I think uh, uh, <laughs> by virtue of Georgia not being able to defend itself uh, from, from another incursion, uh, we create uh, a potential temptation for a calculus uh, that could be very destabilizing in a situation like you described. My last comment, uh, in terms of training Georgia for homeland defense, um, that's, to me, a bit more sensitive even than allowing Georgia to buy these defensive weapons. Because the training then gets into the whole debate of who's to blame for the Russian invasion of Georgia. And I think, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll all go to our deaths, ne deaths never really know, really knowing exactly what happened. My, my strong feeling from being in the middle of it at that time, uh, along with Ambassador Freed, was, uh, the Georgian side uh, uh, was goaded into making a terrible choice. And a trap was set for it, and, and Georgia stepped into it. Uh, and the narrative has been terribly skewed uh, into one that says that uh, the Georgian side wanted it, wanted the conflict, uh, pushed for it. Uh, I didn't feel that at all at the time. Uh, I did feel desperation in Tbilisi, a sense that uh, nobody, or not enough people were paying attention. Uh, and, and that led to a, a huge miscalculation that leads then to the U.S. administration still being hesitant to allow Georgia to acquire those weapons or, or to engage in the training that it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Richard White, Hudson Institute. It's a good, it's actually a good question because it's a good legacy to the previous ones to follow on in ways. Uh, the first one is the uh, the Afghanistan transit route, as the ambassador now has a few more important experience has been um, the, uh, unre the the lack of readiness on the, the Azerbaijani side uh, to allow uh, vehicles that have been in combat or been on the ground to uh, be temporarily based on Azerbaijani territory and washed and cleaned up so that they can then be put on ships uh, and sent onward. Uh, George is willing to do that, uh, but then if you have U.S. military equipment falling into Georgia. We get back into that same problem of the narrative after after the Russia-Georgia war, where there are a bunch of U.S. military uh, components and pieces of equipment that are now on the ground in Georgia. The Georgians would love that uh, as a way to send a signal to Russia to keep its hands off. Uh, I, I'm not so certain the administration is comfortable with that. And so 
Um, when I left Azerbaijan, that negotiation over um, the, they called them wash racks, so the cleaning and washing of, uh, of equipment that had been on the ground in Afghanistan was underway. Uh, when you were asking the question on Iran, my, you know, my uh, entire 23-year career instincts were kicking in where I'm saying, well, I don't handle Iran, and this is a very sensitive topic. I, you know, I, I ought to not comment, but wow, how liberating to be able to comment. So I'm going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think what we ought to be doing, and I'll focus on, on Azerbaijan again. I mean, I'm you know, no expert on Iran at large, but I think um, we do need to spend a lot more time considering whether there's any utility <coughs> in uh, working with Azerbaijan uh, to shape events on the ground in Iran, not militarily, but to think about um, the political significance of having a large ethnic Azerbaijani population that really is in the elite levels uh, of Iranian society, beginning with the supreme leader, who's ethnic Azerbaijani, and many other political leaders. And you know, as anybody who knows anything about Iran knows, the revolutions, in recent centuries that have begun in Iran have started in Tabriz, which is a historically Azerbaijani city. I, I don't know what that means. I, I don't know that there's any there there, any, any sort of uh, sociological, cultural, political dynamic that could have an impact on political developments within Iran. But we should be asking the question. We should be asking our people on the ground in Azerbaijan what they think. Uh, and we should be uh, asking, for example, what did last August's events in northern Iran mean around Lake Urmia when there were there was a large-scale protest movement, largely ethnic Azerbaijanis, who were protesting the drying up of, of a lake in northern Iran, uh, which they depended for their livelihood. There was big concern about the environmental consequences thereof. Um, and there were even calls among some ethnic Azerbaijanis for autonomy and even independence. Uh, there were clashes and some football matches over a couple of weeks. Uh, and so there's, there's a need for us as a government and as an, an intellectual and academic community to understand what's happening and what it means and whether there's something there that would uh, provide the ability to, to shape the politics uh, within Iran. But at this point, I, I don't sense we even have a desire to try to shape the politics of Iran. I, mean, I, I, I left my foreign service career in a country on the border with Iran really not having any insight as much as I asked as to whether or not we do wish to shape politics inside Iran uh, and try to resolve the, the non-proliferation problems uh, in, 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 in a political way uh, by having an impact on the domestic uh, politics. Uh, so my, my recommendation would be to think about that. Uh, I, I, I would personally believe that we ought to be trying to shape politics in Iran. Uh, and if we decided there was an Azerbaijani component to this, we would have to proceed first and foremost from what I talked about a few minutes ago the deep Azerbaijani aversion to be involved in any direct way, in any confrontational way, with Iran. Because every day, uh, Azerbaijan, again, has to wake up and have a truly menacing neighbor uh, on its borders, uh, up to some very dangerous things within Azerbaijan itself. Thank you. Alex Fenoff, Foreign Service Institute. Uh, Ambassador Bryza, you mentioned under security conflict resolution, I'd like you to comment on second track diplomacy efforts. I have a fascinating speaker in one of my classes, works for the US government, is passionate about water. He says there are all kinds of things that need doing in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Karabakh, Georgia, etc., having to do with water. When I brought this up with various ambassadors, their eyes blazed. <laughs> Uh, is there something to be done in this area? Uh, thanks, Alex. I, I, I think the place where there's a lot to be done in water is, is Central Asia. We're not talking about Central Asia. Uh, in the South Caucasus, I, I don't really see it in terms of a, a track to diplomatic initiative that can bring the parties together. I mean, the, the Kura River and the Aras Rivers are, are, are the big ones in, in the South Caucasus. Uh, they flow fine from, you know, from Georgia into Azerbaijan and then along the uh, Iranian uh, Azerbaijani border. Uh, it, it, within Azerbaijan, there's a, a massive undertaking, hopefully about to be launched, uh, to expand the irrigation and renovate irrigation, uh, largely from the Kuro River, but also from the Aras River, uh, to facilitate development of large-scale agribusiness. Uh, I hope that happens, because agribusiness could then turn into a major sector that could provide, could take up some of the slack uh, for exports as oil and gas exports decrease in, in coming decades. Though, even though Azerbaijan's always traditionally been an agricultural economy and society, 
uh, agribusiness isn't going to replace all of those uh, all of the revenues when oil and gas uh, production decreases. Uh, but no, I, I, I actually I don't mean to uh, to extinguish the enthusiasm for that idea, but I, I, I don't see water as something that can bring the sides together. I mean, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in, in, in Stefana Karabakh, um, there uh, is a real need to, uh, there has been a need to provide the population with, with potable water. Uh, the system was very antiquated uh, in, in, the, in that city. Uh, the U.S. government has supported uh, its modernization on humanitarian grounds, but when we do that, we drive the Azerbaijanis crazy, uh, so water becomes a divisive issue. Uh, and again, as far as the flows into Azerbaijan go, and into yeah, with Azerbaijan, there's, there's really not a problem. But perhaps I'm, I'm missing something. But I, I would focus the water on Central Asia, where there's a lot to do. Um, let's go in back to free and here, and we'll just come back over here after that. Yes, I, I totally agree on internal reform. Uh, I didn't mean it just as a remark in passing, saying that all those other areas are, are unsustainable in terms of progress without uh, real progress internally. Uh, 
in uh, Armenia, we we thought there's been some awakening on domestic reform with the demonstrations that were allowed and sanctioned and didn't lead to a revolution, thank goodness. And freeing of political prisoners was a major step forward in Armenia. Uh, and we've, uh, or the administration has tried to uh, reflect that uh, in a warmer relationship with Sarah Sarkisian and his team. So that, that, that's good news. Uh, it's just a start. And the politics of Armenia uh, remain uh, extremely challenging and uh, influenced by business interests and oligarchs, uh, just as is the case in Azerbaijan and, and as well in Georgia to a certain extent, but probably not as much. Um, perceptions are interesting, <coughs> looking at Azerbaijan and Georgia. Uh, pretty, I think without exception, every Azerbaijani that I encountered who had visited Georgia during my, my, my year there just now, uh, as well as my other travels, without exception, everyone said, wow, Georgia, that's what we wish an oil state could be like in terms of the lack of perceptible corruption. Business people say it's, it's, it's so much easier to, uh, to be able to launch a business or to sustain a major investment in Georgia than elsewhere in the Caspian region. But something has happened there on the corruption side, and it's not just the traffic police. Something deeper has happened. Uh, and the economy, uh, of course, has suffered since the, since the war. Uh, but it appears that uh, the foreign direct investment may be starting to pick up again because people do see that's, a, that's Georgia is a, a very advantageous platform in which to begin, given the geography and the progress in fighting corruption. Politics is a different story. And uh, I think, uh, uh, well, President Saakashvili has said, and has heard from all of us, by the way, that it's crucial that the parliamentary election has heard from all of us that the parliamentary election uh, has to be free and fair if he, President Saakashvili, is going to remain uh, credible. And his reply is, you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to fill Georgia with as many EU observers as possible uh, so that they will themselves be able to see that that election for parliament will be free and fair and that uh, all that uh, Mr. Ivanishvili uh, won't be able to buy a bunch of election observers who will falsely claim that the election was stolen. Wow, he threw down the gauntlet. I, I hope that EU picks it up and does flood the zone with observers. I hope we send a lot as well, and that those observers will be all over the country and will be able to make a determination as to whether or not the election was stolen and or who would have done it. Uh, the bigger question, of course, is the next election in Georgia and uh, whether President Saakashvili uh, will ride off into the sunset uh, and uh, whether or not a new generation of Georgian political leaders will come to the fore. Uh, and we'll have a chance uh, to compete without external influence, by the way, without uh, the, the fear of being sponsored by, by Russians or other outsiders. I mean, Georgian uh, politics now are hysterical with allegations that Mr. Ivanishvili receives all this funding from Russia. I don't know. All you may be able to shed some light on it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's an issue that's going to have to be dealt with in Georgian politics, and it's an issue that will distort Georgian politics for some time uh, until there, there really are uh, political parties in that country that can operate on their own uh, with funding that uh, is unrestricted uh, in a situation in which business people uh, have the ability to, to donate to whatever party they wish. Um, within Azerbaijan, uh, much more challenging uh, reform situation. But I, uh, my remark was not that we should postpone uh, our, our, our push on reform. It was that it's not as bad as many think. That's not saying that it's great, but I think it's significantly better than many people think, and certainly not so bad as to write it off. That's my point. We need not to snicker uh, about how hopeless the situation is in Azerbaijan. There are a lot of uh, senior leaders in Azerbaijan and a lot of young people uh, who are committed to making the system better. Uh, there are efforts underway within the presidential administration on thoroughgoing legal reforms, on advancing e-government, for example, uh, or on developing a new strategy to combat trafficking in persons or uh, to combat corruption in, 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 in deeper legal ways, for which the presidential administration is looking to our government for advice, not just technical assistance, uh, but sitting down with them and planning out the strategy and being with them as they try to move the process forward. Uh, you have uh, a situation in Azerbaijan where uh, the president truly does enjoy unrivaled popularity, just as Russians say about Vladimir Putin. Uh, Ilham Aliyev is popular beyond comparison with anyone else. Even the Eurasia Foundation's uh, polls that I saw when I was uh, in Baku showed that his approval rating, President Aliyev's, was 80% or higher, 80% or higher. 
Other polls I saw that tried to discount for the f intimidation factor or fear factor that people can't answer uh, openly had similarly high approval ratings for the whole idea. Um, and so the, the question is then how long can this period of, uh, of support for Ilham Aliyev last when admittedly the economy is structured in a very unfair way? The economy is structured uh, according to the, the Hanis, in, in my opinion, that have dominated Azerbaijani society for centuries. I mean, there hasn't been an Azerbaijani state except 1918 and 1920 and then since 1991. Otherwise, Azerbaijan was divided up into five or six Hanis. And the economy is still divided up into uh, five or six oligarchic groupings. Uh, younger people have opportunities if they're well educated, and especially if they're, they're uh, connected. They have opportunities for uh, serious entrepreneurship. They have opportunities to build companies, to get decent jobs, because there's so much money pulsating through the Azerbaijani economy right now. So the government of Azerbaijan has bought itself some time. I, I don't know how many years, who knows, five, 10 years. It's bought itself some time to put in place thoroughgoing reforms that will uh, convince Azerbaijan's young people, the same age group and type of people who went to the streets in the broader Middle East, uh, that if they go to the streets, they risk losing something uh, in terms of a promising future and good jobs and the ability to make a decent income for their families. Uh, the, the, the jury is still out as to how long uh, this momentum will be sustained and whether or not it will, it will be consolidated in a way that provides that confidence over the long term to young Azerbaijanis. For now, however, uh, in my assessment, there's no chance of uh, the sort of uprising uh, as in, in the Arab Spring in Azerbaijan because there isn't the grinding poverty in Azerbaijan that there was in Tunisia or in Egypt. It doesn't exist. Uh, and there are very few young people now who are so politically uh, animated that they wish to give up their ambition for a good life, uh, for some sort of a political cause. I do fully understand that that can change on uh, time. And uh, uh, just leave it at that. That could change on time. <laughs> I want to comment. <coughs> on the Gorna Karabakh, uh, Your Excellency, I do not believe now is the time for a breakthrough. I don't, I don't think that there's an imminent miracle about to happen. No, I think the, the US administration needs to put in uh, the effort over time at, at an even higher political level. Uh, to try to bring the parties together at, at, through meeting after meeting after meeting. Not, not in a way that, uh, that Dmitry Medvedev has done. There's no way President Obama is going to sit down with uh, Presidents Aliyev and Sarkisian and try to broker an agreement. But there are aspects of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict that should be on the agenda. Vlad pointed to it, peacekeeping. Uh, the issue of Russia's desire to write into the agreement, to include in the agreement, a justification for uh, it providing peacekeepers has to be addressed. Do we favor that or do we not? We shouldn't just ignore that. That's something that ought to be discussed, I think, uh, at, at the highest levels between Russia and the United States. Uh, do we have some sort of a joint approach? Uh, I, think, I think it's not sufficient simply to hive off the Nagorno-Karabakh negotiations to, to uh, a mediator, whether it was myself or somebody else. Uh, without that support from time to time at the top level, at a summit meeting or a ministerial meeting between the U.S. and Russia, or the U.S. and the EU, or especially France, uh, it's, we'll never get to a point where the two presidents feel they've got enough political cover in the international community to take the very difficult decisions they must take that would be really unpopular to finalize the agreement. So a uh, breakthrough is not around the corner and will never happen unless we do this diplomatic homework uh, to, to provide comfort to both presidents. Those three sets of strategic interests I outlined are U.S. strategic interests, and each one is, must, be, must be pursued regardless of whether or not there's progress on the other ones. We have to pursue them in our national interests, but we will not succeed in the long run unless all three are moving forward. Each one is in itself significant and important. Uh, and in this administration, I mean, in the beginning, it was uh, not considered to be appropriate for us to be pushing so hard on democracy. I was, quote, unquote, accused uh, during my confirmation process of being a uh, uh, neocon who pushed too hard for democracy. I, I don't even know what that means. I mean, I thought I'm an American and we all have, we believe in democracy. I became a, a government official because of that. But for some reason, when I was up for confirmation, that was considered to be a negative. A very strange city this is sometimes. Um, so we have to pursue those security interests no matter what. But uh, if Georgia, yeah, if, if, if there isn't a sense within Georgia that uh, there's a new generation of political leaders coming to the fore who are going to be able to sustain the progress to date uh, and re-energize the politics. 
uh, then we will not be able to sustain the pursuit of our security interests or our energy interests in Georgia. So specifically, what should happen? Well, one, at the risk of being a little bit repetitive, forgive me, uh, it's essential that this round of parliamentary elections has full legitimacy. And uh, so there are you know, a whole series of specific things that need to be done in terms of Georgian legislation to make that happen. And sometimes it sounds like a bit of a repeat of the past. I mean, there's always concern about the Central Election Commission and voter registration lists, uh, and then parallel vote counting, and the actual tabulation of the votes, and all, you know, all that needs to be done transparently in accordance with legislation. And, and, and as was the case during, or just before the Rose Revolution, uh, there, there are, there's a need for uh, electoral uh, code reform. Uh, but beyond that, I think probably the most significant thing President Saakashvili can do is to provide clarity soon uh, about what his future will be. Uh, according to the Georgian Constitution and then his own uh, pledge to reduce the length of his initial term in November of 2007 to defuse the crisis at that time, uh, yeah, he's, his term will, will finish soon. So uh, everybody is wondering, uh, what will he do? Uh, everybody, uh, well, our friends of Georgia hope that there won't be anything that happens that would lead to uh, accusations that you know, the constitutional system had been somehow uh, manipulated to allow the, ret the retention of power by President Saakashvili in a new form. Um, it's easy when you're in, I, I presume, in a position of power like that to feel indispensable. Uh, but as we know from our own country's experience, even God forbid, when we, when we lose a, a, a national leader, there's always somebody to step in, and that's when you know you have a real democracy, when, when a capable leader is, is able to enjoy immediate legitimacy, has a vision uh, that can unite the country and can uh, implement the reforms that are necessary or the policies that are necessary. Um, that's not, it's not clear in Georgia right now who, who that could be, who that grouping of people might be. And there's so much suspicion over whether or not the, there will be an attempt to keep power in, in a narrow circle uh, on the one side versus this fear, as, as we've been debating just now, as to whether or not one grouping coalescing around one person is somehow influenced by, by, by Russia. To me, Georgia is not going to be a healthy democracy until that debate no longer exists. This is, this is not a debate now about democracy. It's about manipulation of power. Uh, what needs to happen is that there be uh, a full uh, implementation of the vision that we all embrace so uh, fervently when the Rose Re Re Revolution took place. Uh, that revolution went far. It did some remarkable things. Uh, Georgia's record on reform, we should call a spade a spade, is remarkable, given the neighborhood. Georgia has done a lot, but not nearly enough. And I don't say that as a throwaway, not enough. So uh, I, at the risk of recapping what I just said, there's still electoral reforms that need to happen. The same electoral procedures that are necessary, that were necessary uh, back in the, in, in the lead up to the Rose Revolution need to be implemented. And there need to be massive, large scale uh, electoral observers who will be able to assess whether or not the election was conducted freely and fairly. <coughs> but finally, uh, it's really important for President Saakashvili really to define the, his own vision of the future for himself uh, and for uh, the development of a new class of young political leaders who will carry the reforms <coughs> forward.